Hello. Yeah, I'm audible, right? Good morning, everyone. So we'll start our next session. So for so next, next session, session, we have our today's, today's speaker, speaker uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. 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 Gupta. Uh, he's working as an assistant professor in Department of Physics, RB what College of Engineering. He has total 23 years of experience in teaching and research. Dr. Vijitram Gupta has done his PhD in Contents yes. Matter from Harish Chandra Research Institute. He has done his postdoc and work at several yes. national institutes like IISC, Center for Contents Matter, Terry, Institute of Mathematical Sciences, Indian Association for Cultivation of Science, and ASIN Post National Center, Center for Basic Sciences before he joined RBC. Dr. Gupta has worked extensively on superconductivity, colossal management, resistance, physics of structures and interfaces, physics of porous material. He tried to model them using a variety of numerical techniques like Monte Carlo and simulated anything, unrestricted heart rate, and other state of art techniques. Sir has published many papers in reputed journals and conferences. We welcome you, sir, here. here. I, I request, request you to start today's session. Good morning to all of you. Thank you for inviting me for this conference. Am I audible? Okay, thank you. So uh, I again thank thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to uh, present this uh, you know the basic level fundamental level talk on the basics or the fundamentals of quantum physics uh, as is required to have a basic insight into the realm or field of quantum computation. So I will start my presentation with some very preliminary introduction. And I would uh, expect like at any point of time, if you have any doubt, please uh, raise your hand. And we have a system by which we'll take your questions either immediately or towards the end of my talk. So, <clears throat> and you can put your questions in the chat box also. Uh, so first of all, like uh, the the first question that would obviously come to us is, you know, what is sort of quantum information theory or quantum computation? And so I would spend some time on that before I go a little bit deeper into the physics part of it. And uh, it is obviously the the ability to use the physical systems around us to encode them and then to process the information, which has become very very important. And people have been doing it at various levels of sophistication since the dawn of civilization. And uh, and I will skip the part, the historical evolution of quantum computation and technology. But the way as it stands now, uh, it has reached a quite level of super, uh, sophistication where we are used with uh, like day-to-day -day basis. We are using laptops and, uh, you know, all sort of computing technology. Even supercomputers have become quite common these days. India has some very good supercomputing technology also. Then why the why do we need to emphasize or why do we need to look towards quantum computation? So we already have good supercomputers, right? So this could be one question that could be bothering us. So the whole idea, as I would try to probably emphasize through my talk, which will be very brief and to the point, is that uh, there is no comparison because the quantum computation, the underlying paradigm is so different and vastly different. What Dr. Rapuva Patel uh, emphasized is that there would be a certain class of problems where these uh, technology would completely stand out vis-a-vis -vis any other computing technology. And once you reach a certain level of computing muscle power or uh, computing uh, sophistication, uh, these sort of intrinsically quantum technologies would beat uh, any other rival uh, classical paradigm based technology hands down. So, so that is the overall uh, goal or overall uh, reason why we want to move towards quantum computation. So just some little bit of preliminary information. So the basis of any information has is always a physical system, right? So there's absolutely no doubt on that. But if the underlying physical system gets evolved and gets more and more complicated, uh, the set of rules that it functions on and thereby the rules that we use 
to do the information processing and uh, communication, they also evolve, right? This is understood. And so the, when the underlying physical systems that are used for encoding and processing the information becomes intrinsically quantum, we are talking of a new paradigm, which is quantum information processing or quantum computation. So technological advances have enabled us, uh, as we all know, uh, over the last century or the particularly last 50 years, have enabled us to reach extremely high speeds and processing power. Uh, but as I just told you a couple of minutes back, the basic paradigm of current day information processing is binary logic, right? Uh, which is based on currents or voltages in some semiconductor circuit. And that is basically at the essence of modern computational process. Okay, so then why do we need quantum mechanics, right? So the behavior of these uh, binary configurations, that is the high and the low states of the system, uh, of basically the underlying physical system that we are talking about, uh, is based on classical laws of physics in the present paradigm. So we know that at the smallest length scales, this is something that I'm assuming all of you know, uh, I would be happy to take any questions. And if you have any doubts, please feel free to ask them. Uh, but I'm assuming uh, for the sake of brevity that all of you are aware that uh, at the smallest length scales, uh, we already know that physical systems don't obey classical laws of mechanics. And they obey a fundamentally new paradigm, which is called quantum mechanics. This is something that we all of us know. So, and therefore it is, it stands to reason that because these quantum mechanical laws are fundamentally different in many, many ways from the classical laws of physics, therefore the basic paradigm of information processing is different when we come to quantum information processing. Okay, so voice is breaking up. Am I uh, audible? Like, uh, I'm actually uh, not using a hotspot. I'm using the departmental LAN. So this is the best that we have got actually. So I'll try to speak a little bit slow and hope that uh, my voice doesn't get jumbled up. Okay, so, uh, so, so, to, okay, thank you, Nitish. So, uh, so this is something that we have already, uh, we can sort of intuitively understand. We don't need to do anything to understand this much, right? That the basic laws of the game are different. And this is something that we roughly call quantum information processing. So not only are the algorithms and the processing mechanisms different, but the main point that I would like to emphasize in the next couple of minutes is that the, there are distinct advantages of the quantum paradigm over the classical paradigm. And therefore it is absolutely imperative for us to understand or grasp the basics of the physical laws that make complex information processing possible. And these laws have got a name. They are called the laws of quantum mechanics. Right, so what are these laws and why are these laws so helpful for us to, what is the basic quantum mechanical principle that allows us to sort of do these things and at a much superior level or a much better level. So the laws of quantum mechanics can be understood and they can be used as a set of rules by which this particular new game that we are playing can be played. So it is important that we understand the rules of the game before we play the game, right? So the new game is intrinsically quantum and we would love to understand the rules of quantum mechanics before we uh, play this game. So now here, I would like not to take a very formal and rigorous approach because that can be quite dry and very mathematical in nature, and which is indeed there are a lot of exotic and beautiful textbooks that do that. But throughout this lecture, because keeping in mind the time constraint and uh, the diversity of the audience, and many of you I got to know are engineers, I would like to uh, keep it at a much more intuitive level without making it very formal or look very mathematical in nature. Okay, so the meaning and interpretation of these rules of quantum mechanics can be particularly rewarding as it brings out fascinating new facets of quantum theory, which may be exploited for quantum information processing. So, 
the transition to quantum technologies is inevitable while exploring the efficient options for uh, the information processing. And you can look at it in multiple ways. I have just plotted one or two or three important points here that came to my mind. So the first thing that obviously hits you when you are entering, entering this new paradigm is the perspective of hardware engineering. Like just now, one participant, Abhi, he asked this question, like where are we with respect to the hardware component of quantum computation, right? That's the first thing that any engineer could think about, right? I mean, because that's what you are being trained for. So the perspective of hardware engineering is the easiest to understand. So this is the whole concept of miniaturization, right? So when we're talking quantum technologies, we are not talking gross or macroscopic level stuff. We are talking of miniaturization. We are talking of extreme miniaturization, right? Extreme means literally extreme to the point that we have reduced it down to atomic level sizes. Like just now, there was a question on NB vacancy and uh, using this for magnetometers. And if you heard that these are like single atoms that are, you know, trapped in some defect state near in diamond, right? And you are, we are claiming or we are hoping that those single atoms are sensitive enough to act as those uh, extremely sensitive magnetometers, right? Scalar magnetometers, which can be obviously upgraded to vector magnetometers with some modification. I think there was a question by one participant, Shravana. So I just took this opportunity to answer that question. So if you Shravana is listening, you probably uh, you got the answer. So the thing is, uh, the miniaturization is the first thing that is something that we have to be acutely aware of, right? Because we are not talking of big uh, length scales that you can see with your naked eye. This is technology where you know you can't even see uh, the entire apparatus with your naked eye. It's probably so small, so small. So therefore, uh, miniaturization is the key word here. And why do we do miniaturization? Well, there are so many uh, imperatives, but the obvious thing is to pack more structure and more computing power in lesser and lesser space. Okay, so thank you, so Shavana. So um, that was with the obvious uh, uh, like. Uh, incentive for miniaturization and but 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 well like if you look at it from a theoretical physics perspective just the joy of doing something uh, or seeing something happen at the quantum level could be a sufficiently rewarding you know enterprise okay so but however the main point that i want you to focus on in this first point is that well it is good to miniaturize but it is important that we remember when we miniaturize we are slowly leaving the classical limit and entering the quantum limit. And therefore, the classical laws of physics would take over, right? So, and finally, would be contained complete in the quantum limit where we have to talk of the atomic level wave functions and how they overlap and how the electrons are tunneling from one atomic uh, level to another atomic level and all those things will become more and more important. So the atomic or electronic level miniaturization when you're talking about in quantum hardware so that is the new language you need to be comfortable with. So I think this is the biggest motivation for uh, all of you or all of us to uh, learn quantum mechanics and learn quantum physics, because without this, we are doomed. We can't make even a single iota of progress. We can be scratching at the surface, but not making real penetrative work, okay? Because that is intrinsically quantum. So uh, just to complete the point, at this level, the classical laws of physics would become invalid uh, sorry, this was a typo. It would become invalid, not valid. And we have to consider essentially quantum nature of the physical system, uh, which has to be used for storage and processing. We'll come to them one by one. So the second point that came to my mind, again, a very important point is the evolution of the quantum system. Like we know the evolution is of the quantum system is essentially unitary in nature, a pure quantum system or a mixed quantum system these are things that you would probably learn uh, uh, as we start the quizkit based uh, hands on sessions you will go through understand these concepts but whatever it is it has some unitary evolution and the evolution of the quantum system is essentially different from the time evolution of a classical system right so the, the third point that uh, it obviously comes to your mind is how do you transform or how do you communicate uh, basically in this is point 3 and point 4 so information transformation, see information directly, if you transform, if you directly communicate, no, it has, sometimes it can be nonsense. It may not be able to make any sense to in the sense, in the way that you wanted to utilize it. So it is very, and all of you are probably aware of this. Most of you are particularly engineers. You would know that it is often the data processing or the, the backend processing of the information 
that is very, very important. The algorithms that make sense out of the tons and tons of data that gets, you know, that is coming out, you have to run some algorithms and it makes sense of those information. So how do you process that information itself is a Herculean task. And those laws are also qualitatively different for the quantum branching. That is what I wanted to, you to be uh, careful about uh, or be attentive towards. And finally, how you communicate that or convey that information, right? This is information propagation. So this is also very important. So please notice that there are different multiple stages at which the quantum uh, regime is showing its uh, difference or emphasizing that it is different from the classical regime. So in particular, one uh, physicist, the great physicist called Richard Feynman, uh, those of you in physics would have definitely heard of him, but those of you in engineers might have also heard of him. Uh, he's famous for his Feynman lectures. So in particular, in the 1980s, he pointed out that a quantum process, intrinsically, intrinsically quantum process, cannot be efficiently simulated on a classical computer, but it can be very, very efficiently simulated on a quantum computer. So what could be the example of an intrinsically quantum process? Just a simple example that is right now coming to my mind could be a laser system, right? It's an active medium. And as you know, the definition of a gain medium or an active medium is that when you pass light through it, light will get amplified, right? When you shine light on it, it will amplify the light. So this is the process of stimulated emission. Those of you remember your physics uh, 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 would probably remember the thing of stimulated emission whereby you shine light on a gain medium or active medium and the light amplifies and you get output. Output is basically laser light, which is so ubiquitous that we cannot think of modern technology without lasers. Now, how would you model the system? How would you solve the uh, problem of a laser, this gain medium? One thing you can do a classical simulation whereby effectively you extract some effective parameters. So those of you who remember your PU level or engineering first year level physics might remember that the way Einstein, the genius Einstein solved this very, very complicated many body problem is by mapping the entire system of laser to a very uh, simple two level problem, right? He just took two levels, level ground state and one excited state. He called them level one and level two. And he put some population N1 and N2. And then he wrote down an equation for dynamical equilibrium between level one and level two. And just by working out those equations, he established a condition for some effective coefficients, which are called Einstein coefficients. Now that is a very smart, very uh, smart theory, but very low level theory for a very, very complicated system. And definitely it allows you to get some insight. But at the present level of sophistication, where you are talking of information propagation through optical fiber, through lasers and signal, uh, all different types of uh, sophistication, uh, that clearly that level of theory is not enough. So not sufficient. So how do you take it to the next level? So the moment you want to take it to the next level, you're looking at an intrinsically quantum problem, right? Because it's a many body quantum problem and which is interacting with light. So this is right in the realm of quantum electrodynamics where you know electrons uh, are also quantum. The light is also quantum because it's a photon, it's a bunch of photons. This is something that we are probably, all of us remember that you can quantize the electromagnetic field in terms of some small packets, which are called the photons. And uh, the they obey the photon dist energy distribution obeys something called the black body radiation spectrum. I will not go into those details, but just trying to trigger your memories that uh, it's a out and out quantum problem, right? And then it looks hopeless and uh, like lost case, like because it's really hard. So, but then the question is: so given the level of complexity, which suddenly becomes very high, can you how can you tackle this problem? So the claim that Feynman, the last line of this slide that I am showing right now, the simple claim is that if you have an intrinsically quantum computer, which is running on quantum technology, you can essentially model and solve this problems numerically. You can simulate this more problems, right? That's the whole idea. So I hope I have been able to communicate with a very simple example. That's my hope that a very common and a very, very important problem, uh, which looks very common and many of us probably thought it is an extremely doable problem. But uh, I hope I've convinced you that it is not doable at the level of complexity that is required. It is not a doable problem and you need quantum technologies right, to solve this. Okay, so I continue on the theme of the need for quantum mechanics. So you can clearly see that I am a salesman for quantum mechanics in the first part of the talk. I'm just pitching for quantum mechanics, right? Why you need to invest in quantum methodologies and quantum technology. So, uh, so, so let's go a little bit further and uh, uh, so obviously, this is the important point that I made a couple of minutes ago, 
that forget about all this technology, just the joy of dabbling with basic quantum physics and seeing it happen right in front of you is a sheer joy, right? And because it adds to science. And uh, yeah, so there could be some physicists who could say, no, I don't care about what technology you do, but I just love physics and it is adding to physics, right? So this is one way of looking at it. So now, uh, so so how like, how do we uh, how do we implement the quantum computer, right? So uh, the quantum computer uh, needs uh, various steps. So are there any questions at this point? Like, uh, is there any question? Could you put in the chat box, please? Uh, like, uh, just I hope I have this. Uh, Absolutely clear. I've done very simple and fundamental things. Are there any questions, dear participants? Okay, so I will assume that to be uh, uh, like, yeah, so I think this is eminently understandable. So let's proceed. And uh, so now we are slightly changing gear and moving in a slightly different direction. So what do we need for the implementation of a quantum computer? What are the basic steps? Like this is very preliminary, okay? not. To be taken at a great level of sophistication. So, first of all, uh, physicists need to access and control individual quantum states. That is basically prepare intrinsically quantum states. No doubt about it, right? If you don't have a quantum state, uh, forget about a quantum computer. So, that's point number one. Just think about in your mind, I would really be happy if you could think like, what is the level of complexity involved? As I casually go through the steps, so they're just very casual as I read them out. But just think about the level of complexity involved. Okay. So then the second step gets intensely more complex. Manipulate them. Them would mean the quantum states. And basically measure those quantum states, right? That would be the second step. Then the third step would be how to deal with practical systems which are not ideal and isolated from their environments. Uh, but are actually subjected to tremendous noise or errors. This is something that Dr. Apurva Patel uh, referred to towards the end of his talk. Like the last five minutes of his talk, he was speaking on this theme only. So error propagation and noise multiplication. This is very, very important. And uh, so the, the whole idea is that if you just leave a quantum state intact and uh, like leave it in a like isolated place, isolated environment where it doesn't talk to anyone, no interaction, no nothing, then it is peaceful. Like it will evolve in its own quantum way. It will be, still be a purely quantum system. But the moment you're trying to poke it by poke, what I mean, like, you know, put a finger into it and try to measure something or probe the quantum system, that is where the disaster begins, right? Because now you're trying to interface a quantum system with a classical system at different levels of sophistication. I will not go into what are the different levels of sophistication and I will also not go into the things of measurement paradox and the collapse of the wave function. These are very uh, hardcore quantum concepts. I'm not avoid, I'm not getting into those things, but it's very obvious at a very intuitive level that you have a quantum system, pristine quantum system. You are poking it or you're probing it with a with a something because you want to get some. You are trying to use it as a resource and you want to probe it and get some information out of it or see how you can put some information on it. The moment you are doing, you're flirting with danger, right? Because that is where the interface begins. It starts to interact with the environment and it decoheres. The word decoherence simply means that what was a coherent system and a peaceful unitary evolution of the quantum system actually leads to tremendous decoherence to multiple channels. The biggest source of decoherence would be the interfacing with the probe that you have inserted from outside to poke and probe the quantum system. So this is the third point, what is written here. So the I'll just read out the, the thing. So I just see that like I hope all of you would understand this. So basically, how to deal with practical systems which are not ideal and isolated from the environment. So I hope why this isolating from environment part is important. That is clear to all of you, and they are basically subjected to noise or errors. Now this noise or error, the biggest source is what you are poking from outside, but that doesn't mean that, that there are no intrinsic uh, noise or errors. In any quantum system, there are intrinsic noise is also there. So that part I'm. Not even mentioning. I'm simply focusing on the part that is coming from outside due to inadvertent environmental effects. So these considerations would lead us into an experimental regime. Just think of the experimental complexity of testing our ideas of quantum reality and into discovering new quantum phenomena. So this is probably the hardest of the lot, the this point point C. 
And this is actually the reason what when uh, somebody asked Dr. Apurva Patel, what is the present state of India? Like if you heard him clearly, like he clearly said, we are just stuck with two qubits. Like if you are just wondering why the uh, why why on earth are we stuck with two qubits, and not uh, uh, like if you look at Google and all these companies, D Wave, they have gone to 50, 60, 100 qubits, right? So what, where is it that we are stuck? It is basically this point where we are stuck, right? Because you can simply you can add the qubits, but it will not it will just give you some junk. You will not be able to make any sense out of that, right? Because there is absolutely so much of noise over there. Okay, so uh, these are some three points that came to my mind. There could be others. I'm not claiming this to be exclusive and extensive talk. No, not at all. This is just to give you some motivation. So the the third uh, sort of uh, motivation why we want to do this is basically from the computational angle, from the computer science. Those of you are computer science engineers or uh, like interested in uh, information processing, computational aspects. There's a motivation from that side also. So the foundations of modern computer science was uh, laid down by the great work of Alan Turing. All of you know this, this was in the 30s, 1930s. And he proposed very abstract models of computation, uh, which is embodied in what is presently widely known as the Turing machines, right? So I'll not get into the Turing machines. Uh, these are well known, particularly to CS people. And there's something called the universal Turing machine, which is an idealization of a model of computation. Uh, which can basically execute any computable algorithm. All you need to have is an algorithm, right? I want to do something, I have some task. There's an algorithm step by step. Do this, do this. Like all of you know what's an algorithm, so I don't will not explain what is an algorithm. So basically, when uh, something which doesn't have brains and can some simply take orders one by one, you just tell it in step by step. First, do this, raise your left hand, then uh, take your right hand, do something. Suppose you're brushing your tooth, it will tell you how to put the toothbrush into your on your teeth and how to rub it also. Every step has to be broken down and told. That is an algorithm, right? So the whole claim of the universal Turing machine is if you have a computable algorithm, uh, or in short, any task that can be run, run on a modern com programmable computer. So, so that is basically the universal Turing machine. So the notions of computability of problems and efficiency of algorithms were also developed by Alan Turing. And basically, the ideas of an efficient algorithm versus an inefficient algorithm, these concepts were like almost 100 years old. Like this is 2021. These, if you look at the papers by Turing, like these ideas were seeded in 1930s only. So it's almost like 90 years old. So, so the algorithm is known to be efficient if it takes polynomial time for execution. This means that the time required for it to run is, uh, it basically grows as a polynomial. Like polynomial of what? It's polynomial in the number n, where n is the number of input bits. So again, I will not go into what it bits, and this is not a talk on the uh, at this preliminary level. So I am absolutely sure of you know what is a bit and all this stuff, how you store information at the classical level. So it's a polynomial in the number n of the input bits. Uh, basically, basically some power of n, n to the power alpha, let's say some alpha. That alpha we don't know, but it's n to the alpha. So a computationally hard problem is one. So just uh, this is a very basic level uh, segregation. Easy problem, or doable problems, or polynomial time problems versus hard problems, right? So a computationally hard problem is one for which the best algorithm that you can design, the smartest algorithm that you can design, is exponential in the number of input bits. So n is not in the n is not the base which you're raising to some power. N is basically sitting in the exponent. So it is basically grows as a to the power n, where a is some constant, right? Typically, this constant would be derived from the physical parameters of the computer of the physical system that you are using for the computation. Some physical parameter, right? It could be the the suppose it's based on some defect states which are propagating information. It could be the defect density, for example, right? Some number which you have reduced to something like a time. Any physical quantity can be reduced to some effective time or effective length scale. So these are again things that I will skip. But uh, you can just think about it like it's just very logical. Like if I give you a certain physical quantity, it is easy to extract by doing some dimension analysis, some effective time scale out of it. And basically, this is telling you that the computationally hard problems of the world are the ones where uh, it goes as a to the power n. So really hard, right? As uh, Feynman pointed out, the evolution of the quantum system is one prime example of a problem that cannot be efficient. This is the main point I wanted to really focus. And 
If you understand this, I have done a good salesman job because this is essentially the problem. Like many people would think that, oh, why quantum computation? I can build bigger and bigger supercomputers and um, we can sub kuch kar sakte hai on a quantum. I, mean, I don't need a quantum computer. No, sorry, it's not like that. That is fundamentally different. Okay, so this is the point. So the point is these, what are we calling the computationally hard problems is what Feynman showed is that the evolution of a quantum system is a prime example of a problem that cannot be efficiently simulated on a Turing machine. So basically, it is one of those hard problems, the computationally hard problems, A to the power N that I described just now. And this can be very easily shown. If you just take two uh, spin system, two spins, four spins, eight spins, you can see the exponential rate at which the complexity of any simple quantity that you would like to calculate grows. So basically from there, you can show that uh, these are basically the hard problems. This is what Feynman had showed in the 80s. So this basically posed a serious challenge to the, what is known as the church Turing hypothesis. Uh, again, we'll not go into this. And uh, which was basically that any computation can be efficiently simulated on a Turing machine. Basically, this is what it is, the church Turing hypothesis. So this Feynman's idea posed a serious challenge to the church Turing hypothesis, and it forced the, the the computational science community to modify the hypothesis and basically first it was modified to include probabilistic machines these are also called fuzzy logic machines so if you know like uh, okay i'll come to it a little bit later in my talk i'll briefly talk about fuzzy logic because some i've seen some students get confused between fuzzy logic and uh, quantum computer like quantum logic like so quantum bits and fuzzy bits so i'll just touch a little bit on that so but the church turing hypothesis was first modified to include this fuzzy logic uh, or probabilistic machines and then it had, was further extended to quantum version right which is full intrinsically quantum so now the problems in the computational complexity have now been extended to include con quantum turing machines so this is the state of the art and uh, while the basic notion of computability of a given problem does not change when quantum machines are, this is important. So please, uh, if you have any doubts, you can ask me later, but I hope you will understand what I'm explaining this. While the basic notion of computability of a given problem does not change when quantum machines are included, the main idea that I'm trying to pitch here is that the problems that were hard problems in the classical sense may become easy problems in the quantum domain. I'm not saying it will become, so it's me, the word is me. So there would be or could be a class of problems and definitely in the course of this workshop uh, the some of the speakers would actually explain to you brilliantly some of these problems which actually become doable and amazingly with brilliant algorithms those problems get solved in a jiffy like but if you wanted to do it classically you are running into heavy weather right those are really hard problems so there's some well-known algorithms and our workshop is actually covering some of those algorithms also so let me emphasize the point because this is very important uh, the basic notion of computability is not changing, but uh, the problems that were really hard or you could not do uh, without, you could not do in any finite time actually becomes, may become easy. So the quantum computation may also resolve other questions in the area of computational complexity. So this is, this whole domain is a domain of computational complexity, whether something is doable or not doable. Uh, that too, when you say doable, doable in infinite time is not called doable, okay? Suppose I say that I can do something, but it will take 1 billion years. That is not a doable thing, right? Doable means something in finite time. Let's say a couple of days or let's say a month. It was really hard. Okay, so, okay, so I think that is a very brief overview, bird's eye view of whatever we, I'm going to uh, talk about. And now one small uh, slide on uh, like sort of figuratively or just trying to look at it in some uh, different way, some diagram, some Venn diagram type of picture. So what I'm trying to show here is that uh, various subjects are straddling the quantum information science, and there's some mutual overlaps between these three ellipses also. You see the central ellipse is a bigger ellipse that's called quantum information science. There are three ellipses straddling the sides, engineering, one I call engineering. So if you uh, listen to me carefully, you would have seen that Engineering is basically that entire quantum hardware part is engineering, right? There's hard code engineering where you're handling electrons at a single electron level, not at a bulk level. So the traditional 
electronics that we are comfortable with, the semiconducting revolution is running on bulk electronics, right? Bulk electronics would mean you're handling how many electrons? Average the number of electrons, 6.0 to 10 to the power 23. That's huge. I mean, that's incountably huge. That is a different order, a different paradigm. But here we're talking of manipulating single electrons. That's really hard, right? So that is the engineering part of it. Then comes the computational part of it, which I call computer science. So that's all the complexity part and computational part, or algorithmic part, whether something is doable or not doable, whether it's NP hard or whatever. These are the sort of issues or quantum machine learning and uh, how we can adapt some ideas uh, in, of this quantum technologies into machine learning and stuff like that. And finally, the third component, which is I kept deliberately at the bottom, is basically because I think it's a foundation. It's called physics and foundations, right? So the physics part of it. And obviously there are overlaps between these three ellipses. Like physics is overlapping with computer science. Physics is overlapping with engineering. So it's not, they're mutually exclusive ellipses. They're all healthily overlapping with each other. This is totally interdisciplinary. Okay, so now a little bit of, I mean, just two, three minutes on bits and qubits. So uh, what is the fundamental difference between classical and quantum computing? That's the question that we really want to understand, right? So computation and information processing is built upon Boolean logic and algebra. So all of you know this. I'm not going to get into Boolean logic and algebra. So I hope all of you know this. If you don't uh, have any doubts, you can ask me later. We can engage your answer. You can try to answer your questions uh, properly, like through email, and that is all possible. Like that's not an issue. Just send me in your questions. They'll be all collated, and I will be very happy to answer all your questions one by one. So computation and information processing is basically built upon Boolean logic and algebra, and it is binary in nature. All of you know this. So it basically requires two logical units, which are called the bits, right? So, and it can be thought of as the possible answers to a decision question. So the typical question is framed in a decision, yes or no. Tell me, would you, are you hungry? Yes or no. Do you want to take a bath? Yes or no. Like, uh, this is a basic way you interact, right? When two people are very, uh, not too friendly and they don't like to talk, uh, they can always communicate in this binary mode, right? Do you want to go out? Yes or no. So that sort of communication is going on, right? So any problem, so this is a key point I want to emphasize, is any problem that can be formulated as a series of decision questions can be encoded in bits. I, that is the main point I want to communicate. Just think of any problem under the sun. If you can reduce it to series of like binary questions or decision questions, yes or no type of questions, you are in the game, right? You can set it up for computation. It is it's a good candidate for computation, right? It can be encoded in bits, and therefore you can do some quantum, you can do some processing with it and computation with it. So what is a bit? A bit is basically a binary digit. And basically, if you think of it physically, it is a physical system that basically takes two logical states, right? Which you call by zero and one. So in a typical digital computer, these states are the low and the high states in the microcircuit. So the low and the high states, typically these are voltage states. A voltage becomes very low, whatever potential drop or something becomes very low. Again, we'll not get into the uh, microcircuitry part of it. It is very standard also. Uh, those of you who are uh, good in electronics or studied electronics would know, like it's very easy, right? How to manipulate a electronic state to go from a low potential drop to a high potential drop. So these things you can do. So these uh, sort of states would be good candidate states for a bit or a binary digit. So the next level of generalization uh, would be basically to extend the capability of the computer system by using probabilistic algorithms. So what are probabilistic algorithms? So these are basically based on the notion of fuzzy bits, right? So fuzzy bits are uh, basically something that can, that are not zero or one, but it can take uh, zero with a finite probability P, let's say small p, and one with uh, another probability, which is the complementary of P, which is one minus P, because the total probability has to be one. Total probability cannot exceed one. So if it's zero with probability small P, it is one with the probability one minus P. So you can see that this is a extension of your uh, classical bit. So it's a bit like, uh, just a bit, again, a very simple analogy I'm giving you. These days you might have seen that uh, government has passed a new rule that uh, shops can extend their uh, hard, their hardware they'll be previously they'll be inside the shops only no you have to get inside the shop and look at the items 
but now government has told since this uh, shopkeepers are paying tax they can uh, extend a little bit into the footpath also so you may have seen that walking into the footpath this uh, this uh, this uh, clothes and the, all these clothes are hanging on the footpath or some food item is uh, on the footpath so like the concept of the shop uh, what was inside the shop has now been extended is coming out in the footpath also what was footpath is now a bit of a shop also and bit of footpath also so again this is a very weird type of example just a, a simple example that suddenly came to my mind so i'm giving this example but i'm thinking you can understand right you are sort of extending the concept of zero and one making it a little bit fuzzy so if you ask the shopkeeper where is the shop he will point a little bit towards the shop he will point a little bit towards footpath also everything is shop only because everywhere his item is selling no something like that okay so this is the basically the basis of probabilistic computation also called fuzzy logic okay so very very important logic and i would like to as a physicist it's my job to sensitize you to the fact that the origin of fuzzy logic is again from the domain of physics uh, particularly from at the genesis of quantum mechanics people when they were trying to do statistics of quantum systems these ideas became very uh, prominent and finally it acquired a very mathematical status and become a full fledged mathematical theory so as usual like knowledge is interdisciplinary and one can always freely learn from other domains and grow from by learning from them okay good so now i want to come to my core thing which is the subject what we want to really want to learn which is qubits right so we did classical bits c bits we did uh, fuzzy bits and we now do qubits so the next logical step is on the evolution is the qubit where the physical system is in a linear superposition of the allowed states of the binary quantum system which we uh, like notationally call as this angle bracket 0 0 within some angle bracket and 1 within an angle bracket so actually technically speaking these are called the ket vectors k e t ket uh, so this is some fancy notation that was introduced by paul dirac uh, the physicist and because this was this notation is again from quantum mechanics right this notation was uh, developed by Paul Dirac so denoted as 0 and 1 so it is in a linear superposition it's not 0 or 1 it's not 0 or 1 with the probability but it is both 0 and 1 in certain with certain average in such a way that the probability of finding the system in any one of the configuration is given by the modulus squared of complex numbers so again I will not go into the details, and I'm pretty sure today afternoon, if you uh, are there, you will see Abir will introduce you to, Abir is a speaker, he will introduce you to the, all these mathematical concepts uh, about how to construct these wave functions and what is the interpretation of those linear coefficients sitting before the ket zero and the ket one, and the fact that alpha square and beta square are the probabilities with which you will get the state zero and the state one. All those things you will explain. So. To summarize, the uh, the physical qubit is basically a quantum system, which uh, that will represent the Boolean units, the Boolean algebra, the whatever I refer to, that will represent the Boolean unit. So the angular bracket notation, as I told you just now, uh, was introduced. Uh, uh, basically, refers to the bra and the ket notation. So bra and the ket is basically nothing but a fancy decomposition of the word bracket. So bracket you just broke into the first three, it was made it bra and the last three made it ket. So the 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 complex conjugate of the ket vector is basically called the bra vector. Uh, okay. So and therefore when you take the inner product of the bra and the ket, you basically get a scalar quantity. You get a number out of it. It's like the inner product. So these are things that I will again skip, but uh, because there's not much time for that, and I don't know whether Rabi will be able to do all these things, but uh, I hope he gets some time. So uh, and then uh, so so basically the qubit is then represented as a linear superposition of the basis states, uh, uh, which is written as follows, which I have put in bold because if you forget everything, at least you should remember this equation, right? This this equation in bold in the middle of the slide, psi is equal to alpha times zero plus beta times one. If you understand this part, you have understood a bit of quantum computation. Okay, this is a wholly the first equation of quantum, whatever mechanics or quantum computation. So the coefficients alpha and beta are called the probability amplitudes and they satisfy the condition alpha mod square plus beta mod square is equal to one, right? Uh, that's because the alpha mod square and beta mod square are the probabilities and the sum of probability should be one because the particle is definitely there, right? 
because when you sum the probability, it has to be one. It cannot be 0 0.5. Why? Because the particle is definitely there. I don't know which state it is in. Whether it's state zero or state one, I don't know with 100%. I know with some rough idea, some probabilities, some probabilities I know it. But when I sum the probabilities, it is somewhere there. So therefore, this condition. This is also called a normalization condition. This alpha mod square plus beta mod square equal to one is also called a normalization condition. So upon measurement, the generic qubit takes on one of the definite states. So this is the important part. And I'll very on the slide, I have introduced this concept. As I promised you, I will not uh, bother you or like try to make things heavy by doing it in a very mathematical way by showing lemmas and axioms. There are certain textbooks which do that, but I'm just trying to do it as a storytelling exercise. Let's uh, casually like, yeah. So the point is that the whole point is basically what's called the collapse of the system once you make a measurement. This is what it's been referred to in the last line of the paragraph, the last few lines of the slide. So let me repeat and go really slow here. Upon measurement, see, before you make the measurement, it is in the linear superposition of 0 and 1, ket 0 and ket 1, right? So these are two orthogonal states. So let's say the orthogonal states are high and low. So it's in a linear superposition, high and low. Okay, or, or let's take the composition, the ket 0 to be downspin uh, and ket 1 to be upspin. So it's in a linear superposition of upspin and downspin. Basically, it means you don't know in exactly which spin configuration upspin or downspin it is, right? It is in some linear superposition. So now please focus on the last few lines of this part of the slide. Upon measurement, when you make a particular measurement on this quantum system, the generic qubit takes on one of the definite states, zero or one, with a probability alpha mod square or beta mod square. Is this line clear? I hope it is clear. So when I say probability, uh, again, I will skip, uh, this is not a class on probability, so I'll skip probability and all that stuff. But if you remember your PU level maths, like what you study in maths class, right? When do we talk of probabilities? Like I'll just spend one minute on this because this is really important. And I want this picture to stick in your brain for the rest of this talk. So when do you talk of probabilities? Suppose I toss a coin and ask you a question, like what is the probability of getting half? Is it a sensible question? The answer is no. Because you cannot talk of probability with just one episode or one event. Like I threw one coin and what is the probability? You can't do that, right? So the probability becomes sensible when you make at least 100 tosses, 1000 tosses, 10,000 tosses. The more number of events that you do, then you see that suddenly the number of times you get head and the number of times you get tail start to fall into a pattern and they fall a certain number, which is half. So basically roughly half times, half the number of times you tossed, you would get heads and half the number of times you tossed, you will get tail. And as limit n tends to infinity, if you remember your classes on statistics and probability, you would remember that the number of times you get heads to number of times you get tail, the ratio would tend to one. So it never is one, it always fluctuates. Initially there's a wild fluctuation and slowly it starts to converge, right? I don't know whether my hand is visible or not. If you can see my hand, it fluctuates, I think the camera is on. Yeah, so the it fluctuates and slowly it, it settles on one. It will move very slightly, but there's a small fluctuation, but it's more or less like one. So right, that's the concept of probability. So please understand this line probability in that sense, okay? So what is the meaning then? You take identical copies of the quantum system. Let's say 10,000 copies of the quantum system, and you make the same measurement on it 10,000 times, right? So then those, the, Alpha mod square and the beta mod square would be the probability of getting state zero and state one. That means the actual number of times you get the state zero divided by the total number of measurements would be alpha mod square. And the actual number of times you got the state one divided by the total number of measurements you did would be beta square, beta mod square. I hope this is absolutely clear to all of you. If you have not understood, please feel free to ask me a question towards the end or like put it in the chat box or write emails to me, not an issue. My email is also shared with you. I hope so, because it's there. So uh, yeah, thank you. So thus a qubit is similar to a classical bit. I see this is a similarity, but the similarity ends at this point only. So thus a qubit is similar to a classical bit in that a measurement only gives one of the two values. So please don't be confused to think, oh, can I measurement? How do I make a measurement? It's all in a hypostate, is this and that, as nothing like that. It's in this and that till you make a measurement. 
the moment you make a measurement it is one only you will get one number only don't feel bad about it the time is about not getting the sensible value only okay aisa nahi hai so you will get one value only so it is quantum and that probabilistic thing is in the sense of making multiple measurements it is in that sense so i hope this subtle point is clear to all of you i will pause for a few seconds okay so okay dr anitaen thank you okay thank you madam uh it is sometimes useful to think of these values or or the basis states of the qubit as classical bits so basically sometimes in some certain type of problems you can think anyways this is not so important we'll skip this part so now uh, difference between fuzzy bitting and very qualitative like just to give you some idea not very detailed okay uh, because i know a lot of people have got this question from the students also where they get confused with the fuzzy bit uh, so the fuzzy bit and the quantum bit the main difference would be the just look at the diagram okay so the first diagram is the classical bit is the diagram is very self explanatory i don't need to say anything you have a zero state and a one state look at the fuzzy bit is a uh, zero and one with some fuzziness the dark patch is extending little bit towards the bright patch bright patch is extending to like the shop shop example i gave you shop is extending onto footpath also so everything is shop only and finally quantum bit like this is this is the weirdest part right is superposition of zero and one but only till you make the measurement once you make the measurement it's either zero or one there's no confusion after you make measurement okay confusion gets removed but noise gets introduced so i think all the basic points that you should be really aware of to understand the complexity of this problem i have touched upon all the fundamental points now i'll just elaborate a little bit the main physics based complexity issues i have sensitized you already okay so just to just read out from the slide the qubit is different from the fuzzy bit in that its possibility to have interference so when you look at the qubit you see it's in a superposition of 0 and 1 so whenever you are in a superposition state you can have interference and again i will not have time to go into this in details but i just request you to remember your 11 to physics you studied interference right interference of light why did you get interference of light because first of all they were sort of in phase more or less same phase and when the two waves with more or less constant phase difference come and interfere uh, you get the interference pattern so i will not get time to get into interference but i would request you to go back and brush up your basics because this is very important if you don't remember what is interference you cannot make any progress in quantum computation and quantum information theory and definitely some of the afternoon hands on session also you will not understand so i request all of you to uh, brush up on what is interference just look at the basic interference uh whatever you study in 11 to 11 that only you brush up that's enough okay so the <clears throat> but what was the experiment that stood in your mind when you studied interference i hope you remember that young's double slit experiment right that was the experiment that all of us really adored when we studied interference or what was the double slit experiment right so you got these two lights and then when the light from you are not audible <clears throat> is the signal going well am i audible students or like not students like members yes sir it's audible audible Okay, thank you. I'm audible, right? I just got a message. Okay, so the qubit is different from the fuzzy bit in the sense that you can. Thank you, sir. Okay, yeah, I am relieved that I am audible because I got a message. I was not audible. So uh, that you can get interference. So just uh, to trigger your memory. that young's double slit experiment please brush up like if you forgotten because without that you will not understand anything so something similar to that will happen here okay right the information is carried in the form of the qubits 
and uh, it can have interference. I will go into details very soon. And this is basically a consequence of the complex amplitudes. Let me tell you what I mean by complex amplitudes. Look at this psi is equal to alpha zero plus beta one, right? So those alpha and beta are complex amplitudes. They are in principle complex. That's why when you wanted to extract probability out of it, you did alpha mod square. If it was not uh, complex, why why would you do mod square? Like mod square, if you remember your maths, like we did mod square when we knew it was complex, right? So that is already giving you a hint it's a complex number. Please keep that in mind. And the fact that it is complex has got profound physical implications. We'll see that when you go into the up tutorials and all that stuff, you will be really exposed to these layers very beautifully. It's not just for fun where you're talking complex numbers. They have some physical meaning, right? Okay, so this is a consequence of the complex amplitudes. And a complex number, which, as we all know, it has a magnitude as well as a phase. So while composing two or more such numbers, this is obvious, the phases could result in reinforcement or reduction in the strength of the resultant. So this is what you studied in 11, 12. This is what was called interference. So this is what I've written in bold at the bottom of the slide. The physical implications of and all this that I'm telling you for the last two, three minutes is familiar to us through the phenomena of interference in optics. So now I will uh, go very slowly through this interference part because this is the essence of quantum computation and any technology that you will think of. This is the most elementary example or the paradigm with which we should get comfortable. So I'll go through this uh, at, at not a very great level of sophistication, but at a reasonable level of sophistication. Okay, so let us go through the basic parts because I think many of you have forgotten because many of you are engineers. So, uh, so I'm talking of interference of coherent light. Okay, so when two beams of light, which are described, as you know, the light is described by an electromagnetic field. All of you know that. So, which is described by the electric fields, which is having definite phase relationships to each other. When these two beams have combined, then there are certain regions where the light cancels out. This is called destructive interference. And there are certain regions where it gets reinforced. This is called constructive interference. The dark and bright fringes that are formed when two slits are illuminated by monochromatic coherent light. So just see the figure below. That is very, very obvious. And uh, what is being shown schematically here is the two slit interference experiment, also called the Young's double slit experiment. Okay. So the same phenomena is also observed when two slits are illuminated by a stream of quantum particles, for example, electrons. So this is, will be shown in the next slide, but you should not be surprised because all of you who have studied quantum mechanics uh, know that an electron, when you look at the de Broglie hypothesis uh, or the wave particle duality of matter, an electron is basically a wave, right? At that level of physical complexity, quantum complexity, an electron is not just a particle, it's also a wave. It has a dual existence. It's both a wave as a particle. I hope all of you remember this. So uh, participants, like uh, I hope I'm clear what, what I'm making sense to all of you. So an electron can exist both as a particle and a wave. I think this is uh, elementary stuff. All of you know this. This is what you studied in 11, 12, PU, or whatever, first year engineering. Yeah, so this is basically the, the dual nature of matter, right? Okay, thank you, Ashwini. So the particles, uh, so now uh, it is not a big deal. You don't need light. You can do it with electrons. That's my main point. You need what are called thermalized and monochromatized electrons. Basically, electrons coming with the same energy. That's all you need because the wavelength is connected to the energy of the electron. Uh, so lambda, by de Broglie hypothesis, lambda is given by H by P, and the P is the momentum of the electron. So that momentum can be, so basically you need to collimate the electron P. That's all. It's called a collimator. Uh, but uh, these are the sort of hardware has been done more than 50, 60 years ago. Uh, if you do the collimated today, we, we cannot call it quantum technology. Like nobody will buy it from us because there are very big players who have already mastered this art more than 50, 60 years ago. We need to go much more sophisticated level. I'm suddenly trying to connect to quantum technology, but every level there's quantum technology staring at you. But at what level you can make, you must love be like as Indians, we can make entry. That is a very difficult question because all this mamuli low level stuff is all taken out long ago. Like there's no scope and hope for us also. The only level which we can make entry is at a much higher level. Some open areas are there. Okay, so let's proceed. Yes, Shravana, I think, are you from uh, physics background? Like your question 
shows a certain appreciation of physics. Ah, yes. So yes, it shows. Like you know physics, so you you know this, right? But this is not so obvious to an engineer. I I can bet on it, right? I mean, okay. So the particles uh, which hit the screen at different positions and intensity of the pattern on the screen is interpreted as the probability of a particle <coughs> striking the screen at that position. So classically, we expect two peaks of intensity directly behind the two slits, right? Directly behind the two slits, they should be high intensity. But actually, what do we get? We don't get that. We get this dark and uh, bright pattern. So look at figure C. So what is class? Figure B is the classically expected result, but that is not what we get. What we get is figure C in this slide. I'll just pause for a couple of seconds because I want you to appreciate the beauty of this figure. If it was obvious to you, then I have nothing to tell you. Then I can probably wind up my talk in just another 15 minutes. But it was not obvious to you. You didn't expect this to happen and you're really shocked by what you're seeing. Then we are in business, right? Then I should actually talk for some more time and explain to you why this is happening. Right? This is very important. Okay, so I hope you appreciate the beauty of this. And this is with electrons, not with light. Mind you. Okay. So I'll skip this part. You can uh, the interference between these amplitudes perfectly predicts the fringe pattern, and the general superposition state is therefore aptly called a coherent superposition. This state, state C that you see, is basically a coherent superposition in one word. This is our word will be used very frequently from now on. Coherence, coherent superposition. Okay, so now let us jump a little bit and let us look at the properties of qubits. So the quantum systems have certain uh, counterintuitive or weird. Uh, properties. Uh, we'll, we'll see why it is called weird. It's not really weird, but like it's counterintuitive, which are inevitable consequences of the axioms of quantum mechanics. After a lot of study or experimental data, uh, these laws are sort of axioms are ac accepted by the physicists as a sort of complete theory, which describes the real world at the fundamental level. Uh, and some of these strange new properties are as follows. So we are just listing some. Again, I'm not taking a very rigorous mathematical book like I approach lemma, like SNA. This is like very intuitive. Like I'm just appealing to your logic. First one is superposition and quantum parallels. This is some of the weird stuff that you see in quantum superposition. So when you you can superpose two quantum states, right? And you can get what is called the quantum parallelism. Then the size of the computational space, the direct product space, and how it grows. So the, the growth of the computational space in the quantum regime. So this is something which is a little bit interesting, not a little bit, very interesting and quite counter, counterintuitive. Then you get another interesting concept, which is called the entanglement and also quantum correlations. Again, this will be touched in details, partly by Abhid in today's afternoon talk, and partly we'll see all these things when you look at the bell states, the, the correlated states or the bell states in the Quiskit demonstration. So basically an entangle, what is entanglement and how do uh, and you produce an entangled state? So then you have another uh, really weird property, which is called the measurement and the state collapse. This is what I referred in the uh, about 10 minutes back when I referred to that the wave function was existing in a linear superposition of zero and one until you made the measurement. The moment you made the measurement, it collapsed to either zero or one. Are you getting my point here? So that's like, uh, this is again a very weird example. Don't take it very seriously. Okay. If you ask somebody, what is your gender? He says, I am both male and female, right? I mean, don't take it very seriously. This is just a simple example that I'm giving just because it's coming to my mind. But when you actually make a measurement, you see he's male or female. Like there's some probability, right? As ki both, not like that. So this is really weird. If this is not weird, I don't know what is weird, right? This is the epitome of weird. So this is quantum properties kicking in big way, okay? So this is called the measurement and the state collapse. The state collapses to one of the identities, right? Not, it's not in the superposed state. Okay, then the fifth is the unitary evolution and reversible. This also I've touched upon this point. The quantum states evolve unitarily and in principle, they're reversible. There's a reversible, like you ran the time backwards. In practice, we can't. All of we must know that time always runs from the past to the future. At least that's the way it runs for me. And I hope it runs for you also. We cannot reverse the clock, right? Like we can become kids and all that stuff. This something never happens, right? There's a, some some ideas in physics why it always runs in one direction. Because according to the laws of physics, there's nothing which tells you that a clock should always run from the past to the future. Just think about it, okay? There's nothing in the laws of physics which tells you why this asymmetry happens. 
but it actually happens. So something really to think about. But what I'm saying, the laws of quantum mechanics are reversible. If we ran the clock backwards, it would behave the same way. And actually, there's a name for it. It's called the time reversal symmetry. So uh, again, I will not get into all those details, but uh, many of these unitary evolutions, all these things that you see in quantum systems are reversible in nature. And finally, you've seen what is called the no cloning uh, theorem or the no clone. You cannot clone the quantum system. Basically, when you clone it, uh, there are certain signatures that will be detected and basically you cannot create an exact clone. Clone means identical copy. So this again will be touched in uh, some details in another talk in this particular FTP. So I'm not going to spend some time on this. Uh, okay, so now let us continue. So on the properties of qubits, and the basic mathematical properties of a qubit can be analyzed and studied independently of the physical system that realizes it. So you are realizing a qubit on a physical system, but the mathematical abstract mathematical properties of that qubit, you can study without a quantum system, without a real system. So this is the mathematical abstraction. This is very common. I think all of you understand this, right? So for example, it is one thing to talk of waves and oscillations by looking at a spring, attaching a mass, pulling the mass, the mass goes up and down, and then you show the, see, this is oscillation. That is one level of oscillation. But if you want to mathematically abstract it, what will you do? You will write mx double dot is equal to minus k times x, right? Because mx double dot is mass times double derivative is acceleration, force, mass into acceleration is force, is equal to minus kx. Minus kx is the restoring force, because you know, the more you pull the spring, the more the value of x, more it tries to go back. So it's the restoring force is minus kx. So this is a mathematical abstraction of simple harmonic motion. And just by solving this differential equation, you can extract so much of information. As a matter of almost everything that you do, this entire world of modeling. So when you say modeling of a physical system, what is the meaning of it? Modeling basically means that mathematics is so powerful that you can actually credit everything about your system using the mathematical model only. Right? I mean, I'm sure this is making sense to all of you. Right? So this is what is being talked about here in very brief. Uh, we can study independent of the physical system. And by treating the qubit as an abstract mathematical quantity, like we just don't bother about how we got the qubit. And we can just try to model it as an abstract mathematical entity. We can uh, develop a general theory of quantum information processing. And uh, all these weird quantum properties, therefore, lead us naturally to a model of computation. And this is often called the circuit model. The circuit model of computer computation, and this is something that this IBM quiz kit is brilliant in exposing those layers to you. So I will request all of you to please uh, go through them very carefully and ask lots of questions because if you uh, like, if you participate wholeheartedly, then you can easily pick up. So the circuit model is basically that, right? And basically, it is based on the classical logic gate circuits. Uh, of quantum computation, right? Which is one of the, uh, well, I mean, not primary, but one of the topics of this uh, workshop or faculty development program, right? So, okay. However, like uh, I would just for sake of completeness, there are some other models of quantum information processing have also been developed and I would just like to touch upon them, uh, which is the measurement based computation. Then there's something called uh, the continuous variable computation and also called something called the adiabatic evolution. These are all related to different aspects of physical reality. And anyways, so. Uh, so now we'll spend about some time on the practical considerations and limitations. Uh, okay, this is sort of, if I, if you listen carefully, this is already obvious to you because I've already touched upon all these points at different points in my talk. So I'll go a little bit fast. So the pure quantum systems are found at microscopic level. So obviously they are difficult to access except by very super special technology, very expensive super special technology. For Okay, that's a creation of the physical system. Then what about information processing? For any information processing, we must have the means to assign any desired state to the qubit. I can load any particular state onto the qubit. That was easy for a classical system. Like think of transistors, think of the zero and high state and low state of a transistor, like when it was blocking current or allowing current to flow, those were easy, right? Things that we learned at PU or first year engineering level. But what about a single electron? What about loading information on a single electron or a intrinsically quantum? Is that easy? The answer is a big no. 
right? Because that's where the noise kicks in. All the destabilizing, debilitating factors are going to kick in, right? So the second point is very important. For any information processing, we must have the means to assign any desired state to the qubit. And then manipulation of the states of an individual qubit requires a very high level of technological ingenuity. That's basically the one reason why we India, uh, India is still stuck at two qubits, right? Again, like it may sound a little bit harsh, uh, but that's a brutal reality. That's a harsh reality. Okay, so we need not just uh, one qubit. Uh, that is obviously of no use. But we need large registers of qubits, large qubit registers. And uh, basically, how do you go to large qubit registers? That was the question that was asked to Dr. Uber Patel. Uh, so basically, it may be built out of a collection of non-interacting qubits. So ideally, you would want non-interacting qubits. But can you do it in practice? That's a million dollar question. And the answer, it looks like it's really hard because quantum systems, why should they not talk to each other? They are not, they're very social people, right? Quantum systems, they like to talk to each other. If you put them, if you embed them in a the system, they'll just talk to each other and there'll be a lot of quantum noise that will kick in. Okay, so, uh, so basically that is related to the topic of scalability, right? So whether such a register can be built for the system, is the issue of scalability, whether you can make the system scalable. And uh, finally, to not finally, like one of the points, to implement a quantum gate, uh, we need to apply forces on the system in a precise and accurate manner, uh, which again has to be impervious to error. Again, very hard. Uh, the major problem in practice with quantum superposition states is that they are extremely fragile. When I say fragile, I mean short-lived. The time scale over which they can be sustained or they can be stabilized is very small. Typical time scales is order of nanoseconds or even smaller picoseconds. Like that is really hard to manipulate. When you're bit the the basic jiske sahare apko karna hai, like you want to do something based on something that it it thing itself is so fragile, right? So at the superposition state and all those states with which you want to store the information or convert into some sort of resource, quantum resource from where you can extract information, all those things are short, so short lived. So that is the basic problem. So the slightest interactions would cause a disturbance by which this coherence that you established with great difficulty is lost and the prepared system ends up in one of the basis states. Gone. Your coherence state is gone. It was in zero and one. That zero and one suddenly becomes zero or one. So suddenly coherence is gone. The weak link that they had established is destroyed. This in the literature is known as decoherence and it is very crucial in understanding how the classical world emerges from the quantum substrate. So the whole idea is that the quantum substrate is full of such coherence and signals which are talking to each other. And once they start to decohere, slowly the classical layer, the classical uh, uh, understanding that we have, slowly will emerge out of the quantum layer, right? So the process of decoherence. So this is a very, very important branch. And particularly the physicists have been studying this very actively for the last 15 to 20 years again with very simple quantum models. Uh, and that is one level of activity that uh, we can easily do because it is computational in nature. We don't need any hardcore devices or anything. We can do that sort of, one can do that sort of activity quite uh, easily with some sort of training. Okay, so however, the discovery of quantum error correction and the subsequent evolution and construction of fault tolerant computing. So this is also what Apu sir has referred to in his previous talk has infused tremendous confidence in the success of the paradigm. Despite this issue, despite all the problems that I told you for the last five minutes, people have got sufficient confidence that we can construct, like do this quantum error correction, which means no matter how much noise is getting generated, I can take out that noise and still extract the correct information. Suddenly, just imagine I'm talking to somebody on phone. There's so much of noise that I was singing a song and that song became a gali, okay? like. That is possible. The noise is so high that what was sounding like a song suddenly sounds like a gali or an abusive word. Okay, that is noise, right? But the claim is your this error correction is so efficient that it will completely remove that noise and again it will restore the song. So and this at some primitive level you would have all seen all particularly these expensive phones, the iPhones and all the good phones that we use these days. You might have seen this uh, noise cancellation algorithm is already there, right? Because when you are traveling on the road and uh, you might be speaking, you might have noticed like uh, there's an error, there's an algorithm which actually cancels 
much of the background noise, right? So you're standing bang in the middle of a busy road, but the person you're talking to will hear your voice very clearly. That is a very sophisticated algorithm, right? It is not absolutely clear. If you don't understand the algorithm, you will not even understand why it is so, because the noise of the bus and the car is much higher than the, your voice, right? So why is it picking up your voice preferentially and projecting that to the... So I'm just giving a hint. Don't take it too seriously, because these are intrinsically classical uh, algorithms, and uh, what we are talking about is quantum algorithms. Okay, so the discovery of quantum, to come back to the main point, the discovery of quantum error correction and the subsequent evolution and construction of fault tolerant computing has infused tremendous confidence in the success of this paradigm. Uh, the final challenge, uh, not final, well, there are many other, just what final for my point of view, I just wanted to end it here. The final challenge is the interpretation of the results of a measurement. This is also what I referred to. When there's tremendous noise, you know there's noise mixed with that. How to interpret that signal? It is giving you something. What, how to make sense out of it? That's what I'm trying to refer here. The whole computational process must be set up in such a way that the end result is one of the basis states of the measurement. So suppose you are only going to talk in terms of, okay, this is again a very simple classical example. Don't take it too seriously. But I'm giving this because I know if I don't do this, it will be totally very abstract. So that's why I'm giving this. Just you imagine you have one rupee coin, two rupee coin, five rupee coin, 10 rupee. These are the only coins you have. Okay. And you do some uh, like, you know, you must have seen this, like before the digital currency you used to have this uh, 25 paise and all this stuff, right? Those paise is long gone, but some uh, values prices will be 0.25 or 0.33. Some ridiculous numbers will be there. You might have seen this, right? So how do you pay that? How do you do that? Is it possible for you to, you have to round off, right? You typically, the way you do is to round off. Am I making sense here? So, uh, So when your basis state is limited, this is a bit subtle point. So when you are talking only in terms of finite number, those like that one rupee coin, two rupee, those are the only things you have. But the real world, the financial world is huge. It's a space of real numbers, like all possible from zero to infinity, all possible numbers you have to sample, but only with finite number of coins or uh, rupees, how do you do it? Are you getting my point? It is easy to say in the financial world, okay, round off. So 53 paisa becomes one rupee. So that is very common. In all shops, they will do that. In some shops, they will round off to the extra 10 rupees. I don't have change for 5 rupees. So they will give you one chocolate. In the real physical world, can you give a chocolate? Think about it. The measurement is giving you something. You have some finite basis. How do you capture that information in an accurate way? Anything that you cannot capture in that basis state is a noise for that state. I hope this point is clear. That extra 33 paisa that you could not capture with your basis of one rupee and two rupee coins was a noise, no? In your mind, you must feel bad. Oh, you should have written me 33 paisa, didn't Harap gaya hamare paisa. Aapko bura lagenge. So if you are feeling bad, think of an electron. That electron is like, is doing some work for you. And say some uncompensated stuff that it wants to settle an account. But your system is not allowing you to settle because like it's some finite basis I used to pass. What do you do? That's not. So I'm just giving a very fine physical example. And I hope that you are able to make some physical connection with what is this noise that I'm referring to. Like it's very at your face, it's very solid and you have to handle that. So this is where a lot of complexities would come in. Okay, so then I'll just proceed. I hope that I made some sense to you when I talked about these abstract concepts. Uh, so basically to just to summarize in one line, uh, the, the whole computational process must be set up in such a way that the end result is one of the basis states, like that one rupee, two rupee coin only. So the final value, whatever you tell the customer, sir, pay me five rupees, pay me 10 rupees. As I mean, like 10.2 rupees, no. If you do that, it's gone. So that the measurements give definite and not probabilistic outcomes. So that's the main point. So, uh, so these are, while there are technical challenges in the building of a feasible quantum computer, the actual implementation is not only possible, but also a reality. Uh, reality in the sense we already know that Google has done it, D-Wave, like I will not spend any time on this because this is uh, well beyond uh, my scope and I'm not even an expert, right? So various ingenious techniques in quantum physics have been implemented and some techniques are being rapidly developed. So now quickly a little bit. Uh, okay, sir, how much time do I have now? Satish, sir, how much time do I have now? Can I take another half an hour? 
Okay. After that questions, right? Okay, fine. So the the criteria uh, to be satisfied for physical implementation of qubits uh, were first uh, underlined by uh, uh, some scientist. A very complicated name. I don't like to. You can read it on the slide. Some Italian uh, scientist. And uh, uh, okay, so what? So these are the parameters that he set, and let's read out for you and see if it's making sense to you. First, a robust error tolerant system for qubits. Two, a method of initializing, preparing the initial states. How to load the initial information onto the qubits? Uh, initializing is called initialization. Three. Scalability. The system should be scalable from a small problem to a bigger problem. As you're going up, it should be scalable. It's as an if you can do it only for a certain number of things, then suddenly it breaks down. Uh, so basically, it should be able to replicate to much larger numbers and to make larger registers. The fourth point is ability to manipulate individual quantum states. So this is the most challenging indigenous task. They have told you many times because this is indeed the most difficult part. Uh, that is required to make the computer work. And finally, read out of the outputs. The end result of the computation must be readable. That is the measurement with unambiguous results. Okay, so uh, now a little bit on the physical realization of qubits. And uh, so basically quantum, uh, you can see the sum of the standard technology that is there. This is all physics based. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to give a bird's eye view of what is happening over here. So the systems, uh, the physical systems that I referred to, I'll go a little bit slow here. Uh, the first is based on quantum optics. I'll just read out first these things. Uh, I hope my slide is visible to all of you because there's a lot of information all of this. I hope all of you can see it very clearly. The second is called cavity quantum electrodynamics, also called cavity QED. The third is basically based on something called trapped ions. Uh, the fourth is based on nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR. The fifth is superconducting circuits, and the sixth, which is becoming very hot these days, is based on quantum dots. So these are some of the competing technologies. Uh, there's something based on topological insulators also, which particularly, for example, my, Microsoft Research is putting a lot of money into that. Something based on anions and non-abelian systems. I have not included that. Okay, so uh, what is the information carrier? So all the Physical components I've highlighted in the second paragraph and third, par not paragraph, second column and third column. So let us go to the second column now. What is the carrier of information? So let's first focus on quantum optics. The carrier of information is the polarization of the photon. Just think in your brain, like how efficient it is for us to polarize photons and detect the polarization of photons. So, uh, and basically what is acting as the information carrier is a fact. The photon can exist in one of two modes, like any one of the two modes it can be existing in. So the second uh, architecture is cavity QED. Uh, this is probably one of the oldest architectures. It is basically an atom with two levels, atomic levels, which is interacting with a single photon. So those of you are still fresh in your, uh, just remember your engineering physics first year, what you studied, lasers like Einstein's the two level modeling of the laser. I don't know whether how many of you remember this. So let me just quickly remind you what is the whole idea. Uh, so why I'm telling you first, I'll tell you the motivation. Then I'll remind you what I want to remind. Uh, there's a strong connection in the mathematical modeling of this, what I'm discussing right now, with that two level modeling that Einstein did for the laser system. See, the thing of it, the laser is a very messy, complicated system. It's a full atom, right, or a molecule. Light is coming and falling on it. How do you describe it? It's a weird, very difficult problem. But the genius of Einstein was that he thought about it and said, okay, like it is complicated, but do I really need all that complication to explain laser? And the answer was no. And when he thought really hard, he saw that the only elementary feature that he needed to explain basic level laser was just two levels. So the ground state level he calls E1, the first excited state he calls E2. The population of the ground level is N1. The population of the first excited state is N2. And then he talks of three processes. One is stimulated absorption, which is photons or light coming from outside is getting absorbed by an electron from the ground state and it gets excited to the excited state. The second is spontaneous emission, where a photon, not photon, sorry, excuse me, 
an electron in the excited state automatically jumps to the ground state to relax, to come to the ground state. Because this is the basic law of physics. Every system tries to relax to its ground state. At the end of our day, we always try to go to our home, right? So the home for an electronic system is its ground state, like the lowest level. It would like to be there, right? Not sit in some excited state. We can be in excited state the whole day. But at the end of the day, we have to go to our home, no? So this is something similar. The electron would like to de-excite to the ground state. So this is the second process. And the third process is called stimulated emission. This is a little bit tricky part. And Einstein understood that when photon comes, it can also trigger an electron to jump from the excited state to the ground state. Like normally this is weird because you would always think an electron should always trigger, uh, not electron, a photon should always trigger an electron to go higher. But when Einstein thought about it, he understood that there's nothing to go higher. There's nothing higher. In the space of electron, there are only two levels. So it has another option. It can get hit by a photon and suddenly it can decide, oh, why the hell am I sitting in the excited state? Let me go to the ground state. It will come to the ground state, right? So that was the weird part, but that Einstein thought about it. And when he wrote that, he could uh, he could come up with an equation with, that actually gave you, in terms of Einstein's coefficients, A and B coefficients, he could actually give you the intensity of the radiation. You knew the intensity of the black body radiation. So I'm just reminding you in very brief, because I, I, I fully appreciate that many of you have completely forgotten this, but there are standard uh, notes available. And if you're really interested, please write to me. I will be happy to share my notes because I teach these things in some other uh, global electric and so many other places. So I can share my notes with you, not an issue. So, but this is the paradigm, the mathematical paradigm that you have to think when you think of a cavity QED. So it's a two level atom. Just think of two levels, just like Einstein thought, as interacting with a single photon. Now, this is uh, the architecture. Okay, and then we have the trapped ions, which is the third architecture, little bit uh, complicated and far, far expensive. So basically, these are talking of the hyperfine energy levels of the atom. So basically, these are the vibrational modes of the atom. Okay, so I'll not get into quantum discussion. Then the NMR technology, this NMR technology, is, as far as I remember, is the technology that IAC Bangalore was working on long ago when I was there. That was the technology I used to see. Dr. Anil Kumar was there at that time. So these are the nuclear spin states. You are basically using the spin states of the nucleus, the nucleons as basically your quantum bit, qubit. Okay. Uh, then finally, not finally, the fifth point is the superconducting circuits. So basically, uh, the, 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 the players here is basically the Cooper pairs. So what are the Cooper pairs? These are basically some sort of bound states of electrons, uh, which are basically glued together by some sort of phonons, like uh, phonons means the lattice vibrations. The lattice vibrations conspire in a, such an intelligent way that instead of repelling two electrons, it makes it energetically favorable for two electrons to come and sit together. Think how weird this is, okay? Like those of you who have not studied this before, this should be really weird to you because always you thought electrons should repel each other. But no, like there's something fancy that happens. The phonons, because it's basically lattice vibrations, they do something fancy. And electrons which were hating each other, they wanted to stay away from each other. They suddenly said, oh, no, no, we liked each other. We want to stay with each other, right? So they come close and they form what are called the Cooper pairs. And it turns out when these Cooper pairs are studied and particularly in a certain junction called the squid, which is for the super quant uh, uh, superconducting quantum uh, interference device. So when you study all those things, you can uh, extract what is basically known as a qubit oscillation to the uh, of the Cooper pairs. And uh, so basically it can become like a, behave like a bit. So, and the final thing is basically the quantum dot. So basically again here, the qubit is basically the spin of the electron. So these are some of the important architectures. And uh, in particular, the superconducting circuit, the fifth point in this is what is being actively pursued as far as my knowledge goes by both uh, D-Wave and uh, Google. So these are the two uh, big companies, very big companies. They are all heavily investing in the superconducting circuits. And also quantum optics, the first point is becoming very, very hot. Okay, uh, I will skip this uh, third uh, column. There's too much of information here. Okay, I will go very quickly through this. So how, what is the method of control? Again, you see the variety of technologies that are there. So the when it comes to quantum optics, how would you control quantum optics? You're talking polarization, right? So what is the method of control? Like everything needs to be controlled, right? So what are the controlling gears here? The gears are polarizers, half-wave plates, quarter-wave plates, beam splitters, mirrors, 
non-linear optical media. So if you remember Apur Patel's talk, he talked of all this fancy uh, quantum level, uh, you know, you know, what was the word? It's not coming to my mind. One second. Uh, yes, my quantum level multipath atom interferometers. Yeah. So, yeah. So basically, those are the sort of things that you are talking about, right? Those are the control gears or levers that you have. Okay, if you jump and come to QED architecture, cavity QED, uh, the controlling levers are phase shifters, beam splitters, all uh, linear optical elements. Then when you come to trapped ions, okay, again, you need pulsed laser light uh, to manipulate the atomic state to very, very high degree of precision. When you come to nuclear magnetic resonance, you need pulsed RF fields in the presence of a very strong external magnetic field. Now, a strong external magnetic field is really, really expensive. Uh, by the way, we are always present and uh, subjected to a constant magnetic field. I hope all of you remember that. That's the Earth's magnetic field. And what has become very clear, it just plays a very significant role in our biological system, in the healthy uh, evolution of a biological system. I will not get into that, but uh, but those are very, very weak magnetic fields, right? And the magnetic fields that we are talking about here are really strong magnetic fields, and they are very expensive to make. Uh, then if you go to the fifth architecture, superconducting circuits, uh, the things that you need to play around with, the, the toys and tools that you play are electrostatic gates, uh, Coulomb uh, blockades, uh, junctions, Josephson junctions, magnetic fields, spin interactions, pulsed microwave fields. So these are the sort of things that you would be looking at. And finally, quantum dots. So these are where you need magnetic fields and voltage pulses, electrostatic gates, waveguides, so on and so forth. So uh, I hope this table is useful to all of you because you get a, I wanted all of you to get a quick bird's eye view into the so different things. But now uh, I will quickly run through the stern galac experiment. I will probably take another 10, 15 minutes and then I'll stop for taking questions. So uh, our aim is basically, uh, and why I'm doing this stern galac experiment is because I feel this is the most elementary example and experiment which uh, you should know. And particularly those of you who are not from the physics background, it's very important that you know this because, uh, again, like understanding is very crucial. So our aim is to understand how a quantum system can be used to carry information. Very humble goal we have for us. We basically understand quantum system, how can it be used to carry information. And we wish to identify a system that can exist in a discrete number of distinct states. In fact, the simplest example would be two states to form a qubit. We'll try to put the mathematics in context by first examining the structure of a simple two state quantum system via experiments that bring out the basic nature of qubits. So our goal is very humble. And to prove that how humble I am and we are, we are looking at an experiment that was done 100 years ago, right? In 1922, like exactly almost 100 years ago. Uh, next year will be the centenary celebration of Stern Galak. So, uh, so let's look at the Stern Galak experiment. In 1922, an experiment designed to measure the magnetic moment of atoms uh, produced unexpected results. And these results brought out a new quantum property of an electron, which is called the intrinsic spin, which would take on quantized values. <clears throat> that is one of two values only. It could either be up spin or down spin. So the revolution of electrons, uh, all of you know what is spin, so I'm not going to spend much time on spin. I am assuming all of you at least have heard of the word electronic spin. Okay. So the evolution, the revolution of electrons around the nucleus of an atom is basically like a circulating current. Just try to think of a charged particle moving around the nucleus. We'll not get, to, get into why it reverses and why it goes on forever, why it doesn't radiate energy. Like those are very fundamental issues. We'll not be discussing all those things. But just let us accept the fact that an electron is going round and round. So basically it's like a current, right? It's a circulating current. And a circulating current is basically a magnetic dipole. This is what we studied in 11, 12, right? So the dipole moment mu equals the current times the area under the loop. Okay, so when you do the calculations, when a, basically what you see is that when the magnetic dipole is subjected to a non-uniform magnetic field, B of R, uh, I've written deliberately B of R to emphasize that the magnetic field is a function of the spatial coordinates. That means it is non-uniform. If I didn't write that R, I would be saying it's a constant magnetic field. No, this is not a constant magnetic field. It's a non-uniform magnetic field. So the point is that when a magnetic dipole is subjected to a non-uniform magnetic field, it feels a force 
along the direction of the change of the field. So if you calculate it, uh, okay, so basically the content is written here. The force is given by grad of mu dot p. So grad is gradient. That is uh, in one dimension, it will be delta x operator. In three dimension, it will be i cap delta x plus j cap delta y plus k cap delta z. So that's the full form of the grad operator. And mu dot p is the dot product of the magnetic moment with the the spatially dependent magnetic field. And so basically, as you can understand that if you, okay, forget about the physics part. If I give you a force, a force, uncompensated force is acting on a body. It is obvious the body will get deflected because that's that's physics, right? I'm applying a force. It either has to resist the force, but it doesn't have any way to resist. It should get deflected. So that's basically what's going to happen. So measuring this deflection in a known magnetic field you can estimate the value of the magnetic moment, right? Let me repeat, since you know this expression, you, you know this physics. Now, if you see that the charge particle, this thing is actually deflecting, and if you know the value of the magnetic field, you can actually estimate the value of the magnetic moment. That's the funda that we're going to use. So now look at this thing. I hope this is a, a good diagram with which you can sort of understand what's happening here. This is a totally schematic diagram. Don't look for details here, okay? This is a schematic diagram. A schematic setup of the stern galactic type is shown in the figure. Uh, look at the figure A. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can see the magnets, the way the magnets are designed. Uh, that is the basically the inhomogeneous magnetic field is being created because of that magnet. That conical apex shape that you see, you know, that is creating the inhomogeneous magnetic field. Okay. So, by the way, the Earth's magnetic field is also inhomogeneous. Some of you, like, it's, it's a good thing to remember that. But normally we don't feel that, right? Because the length scale over which it changes is so large that only birds and certain types of insects can make that out. Uh, it is well known, like people have understood in the last five to six years that birds actually can sense that magnetic field fluctuation. They have this quantum sensors in the brain which can pick up. And that's why we can navigate so accurately. These migratory birds, they navigate thousands of kilometers every year. I'm sure all of you know this. And it is well known that it's basically a quantum technology at the heart of that migration because with any classical thing you cannot like and in particular we've seen that even if you blind the bird these are some cruel experiments that people have done on birds like they blinded the bird and they took out some of its sensory skills but still the bird migrated so there was a quantum sensor that was sitting in, inside its brain which uh, like you cannot disturb by blinding it or doing all debilitating experiments so those type of things are confirmed that it is a quantum sensor which and allows the bird to pick up the inhomogeneity of the magnetic fields and sort of navigate in the right direction. And it's just a side story to keep you a little bit entertained. Okay, so the thing is, uh, this is the setup. Uh, and look at the profile of the magnetic field lines in the figure P. That is what we, that is all we need to, to know. Okay, so, and the z-axis is pointing from south pole to north pole. So now uh, let us look at the force. The force is grad of mu dot b. And in particular, the B is basically along the z-axis. All of you can, uh, so when you do that, you can see the grad of this mu z, b z, right? And therefore, uh, what is happening here is that when you add the grad operator, I'll skip this part. This is a bit of mathematics, but I'm sure you can do it. You have to do this partial differentiation, right? Chain, chain rule you have to apply, and this is what you will get. Okay, good. So now this atom is deflected along the z-axis by an amount. The one line summary of that entire stuff that you saw in the previous slide is this one. The amount is deflected along the z-axis by an amount proportional to the z component of its magnetic field. Okay, because mu z was the important term there. Remember, since a magnetic field can deflect magnetic moments depending on their magnitudes and direction, it can be used to select particular magnetic moments, right? So the net magnetic moment of a collection of atoms is just the vector sum of all the individual atomic uh magnetic moments and this is obviously known and therefore a beam of atoms having a specific constant magnetic moment along a particular direction is said to be polarized so i hope the meaning of polarization is clear because concept of polarization is clear for uh light all of you know that because what is the meaning of light polarization the electric field and magnetic field is there no the electric field is pointing along a particular direction that is the polarization which direction it is pointed if it is uh, linearly polarized, that means it's pointing in a particular direction. If it's circularly polarized, the electric field is continuously rotating in a circular way. So all these things I'm not going to get into, but I'm sure you know this. But 
the concept of position can be defined even for the context of magnetic moment. That's about what I tried to explain here. Okay. Uh, so basically, it is possible through this technology to produce a beam of polarized atoms by this specific procedure. So now with the experiment, we'll come to the experiment that Stern Galact did. The beam of silver atoms used in the original Stern Galact experiment was produced by heating silver in an oven, and the atoms emerged with a random direction of magnetic moment. Obviously, when you thermalize something and emit electrons uh, or uh, atoms, they will come out in a random way, no? So the atoms emerged with a random direction of magnetic moment, and the net magnetic moment is therefore zero. When you take random things and you add to a vector sum, it obviously becomes zero. If such an unpolarized beam is sent into a non-uniform magnetic field, then since each atomic moment, magnetic moment is arbitrarily oriented, the Z component of the magnetic moment could vary between plus mu to minus mu. So expect the beam to spread between two extreme limits, which defines the value of mu of the magnetic moment. So this is the famous diagram. Please, you can see this diagram. This explains everything what I told. So A is what was classically expected, right? Because you would classically think that it should be everything between plus mu to minus mu. So there should be all possible values, a white band that is drawn in figure A. That is what you thought. But what was got? What was actually obtained? Look at figure B and see how weird this is, right? Compare figure A and figure B. What you got in figure B is the real thing, right? What was actually observed is just these two spots, right? The silver atoms used in the original experiment have zero average magnetic moment. Hence, what people naively thought was it was expected to pass undeflected or spread uniformly, at least it is spread uniformly. Undeflected is not right, undeflected is totally naive. And uh, so it was expected to spread uniformly, but no, you got something which is just present to two points. And however, what was seen uh, was that the electrons split into two beams symmetrically, electrons or whatever, atoms, I should say, uh, about the central axis, one goes up and one goes down, and measuring the positions of the atom in the state, sorry, there's a lot of typos here. So I made a lot of mistakes because uh, I could not revise it once again. I apologize for the mistakes. Uh, has no net magnetic moment, but has a lone electron. So this had to be the intrinsic moment associated with the electrons in the atom. So therefore, to summarize, thus the magnetic moment of the electron is allowed only to take one of two discrete values, right? So this is the original spin. Just trying to recall it how the constant of spin was born. And therefore, the classically, the magnetic moment is proportional to the angular momentum of the system. Here, the electron magnetic momentum is proportional to a property which is called the intrinsic spin. This is the main concept in this paper, which mathematically behaves like angular momentum, right? Just behaves like angular momentum, but the similarity ends at that point only. There's no other similarity. Thus was discovered the spin of the electron, a quantum property that is allowed only two possible values, plus or minus half. So now, there's this detailed thing which I uh, thought of doing, but uh, obviously the time is not uh, there on my side. So basically I wanted to see how the spin states, uh, so basically the details of the stern galactic experiment, right? How you can use the spin states as the qubit. So, and basically you can construct what are known as the pure states and the mixed quantum states, and also you can do superposition. So basically what the, I will just summarize all the slides in uh, one word. So basically, it is not that you have a system which you are filtering through a, a spin x qubit filter. So this is SGZ, as you can see, there's some fancy notation I've used here. No, I'll just quickly uh, summarize. I'm going to stop going because it will take at least half an hour to 40 minutes if I wanted to do this properly. So you see SGX and SGZ, these are basically the Stern Galact filters or the Z component and the X component of spin, right? SGY would be in the Stern Galact filter for the Y component. So basically, it's not like it's, these are like slits that allow only a particular orientation. Just imagine a rod is coming, and if you have a slit which is aligned with the rod, the rod can go through. That is the classical picture that all of you must be thinking. Just imagine the wall, a rod, a vibrating rod is coming, right? The rod is or changing its orientation like this. At the point it strikes the wall, this is a very classical analogy, just to help you think. The point at which it strikes the wall, if the wall has a slit which is exactly aligned with the rod, the rod will go through, no? But if any other orientation is the rod will hit and it will fall on this side only. Making sense, no? So 
that is a naive picture you might be thinking of this x filters and y filters but what and so therefore what it means that once the rod comes out of that filter it is in that position 100% you know it is in that position right that particular angular orientation is there this is the classical picture but quantum picture i'm just sub sub summarizing all these slides in just 2 minutes the quantum picture tells you no it is such an intrinsic property that even after it comes out from that that uh, slit no in that particular angular position it is again in a superposition of all the angular positions think of how weird this is okay this is a bit like telling okay let me give you even more gross example there's a box full of colored balls i deliberately okay the balls are in some superposed condition i deliberately pick a ball of a particular color and then once i put the ball of the particular let's say red color just to take an example and once i put it there in a separate box i am again seeing that the red is the superposition of blue white green yellow everything and red also if that is not weird i don't know what is weird this is absolutely the height of weird okay so this is the quantum phenomena that is used in superposition okay so this is why the quantum paradigm is so i just wanted to do that in little bit of details and depth but it's okay so it's maybe the good thing that i have not so uh, because this is going to too much into depth of the architecture of how you do this so i think at this point uh, i will stop so and i'll be happy to take questions if you have or if you can put in the chat box it will be fine <coughs> that is the participants you have any questions for uh, dr trivikram so you know, uh, he has covered the quantum physics essentials uh, in a much detailed way. And uh, I consider this is the step one into the quantum uh, computing uh, technologies. So, if we can have one or two questions, we can take uh, if any of you are having, because we are already nearing the lunch time. Uh, Maybe uh, I definitely agree with you with uh, the speaker as well as uh, as a participants. We need to study a lot, you know, uh, to get into the domain. So we are making our best effort to convey the required fundamentals to you. So there's a long way to go into the technology and uh, quantum mechanics part. What he has covered today. Any questions are there in the chat? Uh, not seeing any questions. Uh, I I would assume I made a fabulous talk, so everybody understood everything. <laughs> definitely, definitely. <laughs> okay, Thank you. Question. Chakravarti. I think sorry, the question disappeared. Can I see the question? I, mean, uh, I can't see the questions. Which way? Like chat. 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 Yeah. Uh, Excellent presentation. Okay, thank you, Jagadi sir. Uh, I think Stern Galactic Experiment is one way of creating qubits. Can you mention some other? Yes, Shravana. I, so that's why I, in the penultimate, not before I started Stern Galactic, I was not sure how much time I would get. So uh, Stern Galactic uh, uh, is only one of them, but I, I highlighted about six architectures no? uh, uh, for creating qubits. So, okay, I got your question. So I will go back to the presentation mode now. And I'll reduce this. And so these are some of the architectures that I highlighted because this is something that I really wanted you to take away from this talk. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. Those are the different architectures, right? This is something very important. I spend maximum time on this slide only. That's why. Right. So if you look carefully and you do a Google search, you can take a picture of the slide also uh, because you can do independently Google search each of these technologies, you'll find. Uh, many companies which are investing into this sort of technology uh, separately and uh, okay so i think that answers your question so anything else any other questions students or uh, not sorry panelists participants okay so like uh, yeah so I think the complexity, the physics layers, uh, I wanted to expose, I have done that. And the sources of complexity also I tried to expose, I've done that. So if you have just understood that why it is difficult, why is the difficulty coming from, I'd be happy. 
So that is the goal I've achieved because otherwise everything is just lots of information. And uh, at least the fundamental level, this uh, qubit, the Strangalak experiment and the uh, Young's double slit experiment, I would really expect all of you to study that. If not by today, in other one or two days, you can just brush up your basics. Okay, that is my humble request for particularly those of you who have forgotten all this, because without that, you may not be able to understand. Uh, the manipulation is the most difficult part, Shravana. That's the part that's where all of us are stuck. The error correction codes and the manipulation, right? That is the hardest part. So, particularly the. Uh, yeah, so uh, how many states you mean? How many qubits? Is that what you're asking? I think that's what you meant. So, the number of qubits as Dr. The same question was asked by somebody to Dr. Apurva Patel. He only told. He's an expert because he's an IAC. In India, we have got only two qubits, right? Whereas the international standard, gold standard is Google. Google is, yes. So Google has uh, reached 100 qubits already. And recently, about a year back or a year and a half back, it demonstrated something called the quantum supremacy. Yeah, this is something I would like to tell a little bit, even though it's not an answer directly to your question. I'm just sort of slightly digressing. Uh, <clears throat> the quantum supremacy can be demonstrated only on quantum algorithms, intrinsically quantum algorithms. It cannot be demonstrated on classical algorithms. So what I uh, wanted to say is that uh, quantum uh, algorithms is something that can one can pursue uh, in order to do some, uh, I will not say low level, but uh, decent level of research activity can be possible if one studies quantum algorithms and trying to write better algorithms or things like that. So. That can be one activity of sustainable research within India. Okay, so what was the question? Sumati uh, HR, uh, you had asked a question. Was it an, did I answer you correctly or I didn't un understand your question? I answered something else. Sumati, could you just repeat one second? Okay, Abhir wants to. I would also like to. It's all disappearing, madam. The comments are all disappearing. How do I do this? One second. I should go back to the. Uh, chat, chat, chat. Was that? Yeah, it was stated like uh, Trivikram. I would also like to add that number of qubits is not the only metric for making better hardware. We need to add more qubits and also decrease the error rates simultaneously. This yes, yes. Abhi's comment. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, Abhi. Thank you. That's what I was trying to emphasize continuously. Uh, any other questions, uh, participants? We can take one last question uh, before I'm we so, uh, take so our sorry. lunch. We can't hold you for a long time. Uh, so, I, if there are no more questions, hmm. I personally thank uh, Dr. Trivikram, who is one of my close friends, uh, who is also a part of uh, Circuit uh, at RVC from day one. Uh, we are progressing to do something in this domain and uh, trying to convey you and try to educate all of all of us you know get educated in uh, the domain of quantum computing so uh, I, I i hope uh, dr tribikram has conveyed the required uh, physics uh, essentials to you. Uh, you you need to go back as you said as a student you should open our 11th and 12th standard books to understand a bit of uh, physics, probably we might have forget by this time. So, uh, well, as the things proceed, so we'll get a lot more confidence in the domain. With this hope, I request uh, Dr. Minal, uh, because we missed the formal vote of thanks in the morning session uh, due to technical glitches, I request Dr. Minal to propose a vote of thanks for the today's session. Thank you so much, sir. Sure. So, good afternoon, everyone. There is a call. Uh, yeah. Okay. Hello. Hello. Is it fine now? It is fine. It's fine. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. On the, on the half of RV College of Engineering, I would like to thank AICT Training and Learning Academy Atan for giving us this opportunity to arrange higher day FTP on uh, one of the upcoming topics that is quantum computing. I would, I would like, like to thank RV, RSST Trust and management for their kind support while arranging any technical event.
on the half of fdp organizing committee and rvc i give a heartfelt vote of thanks to our keynote speaker dr kapoor patel for gracing this occasion with his very informative and interactive talk the pillar behind any laurels to rvc is our beloved principal dr k subramania i would like to thank kns sir for his constant encouragement and support I would, I would like, like to, to thank all the esteemed speakers who accepted, accepted our invitation for, for this five days FTP. Mm -hmm. I, would I would like, like to thank Circuit team, team for, for extending their support in handling hands-on session on IBM Skills Kit. I would like, like to thank our head of the department, department Dr. Ramakant Kumar P, for his strong yeah. support by while organizing this event. I would, I would like, like to thank uh, Dr. Satish Babu and Dr. Dr. Sharwani GS for wonderful for coordination while executing this FTP. I would, I would like, like to thank uh, teaching and non teaching supporting staff who helped directly or indirectly while uh, organizing, organizing this FTP. Last, Last but, but not least, I would like to thank all the participants from all over India, India for being, being part, part of this event and making it grand success. Thank, thank you so much, everyone. We so, the participants, uh, we will be back oh, at 2 30 oh, after the lunch for a session by Abhir Vaishnav on the uh, mathematics part, and also you'll be introducing you into IBM QSKIT simulator. Okay, please uh, attend the session, it is very important session from the simulation point of view on the quantum computing. Sorry. Hope you please hope to see at 2 30. Thank you. Okay, sir, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, small introduction about Abir. Uh, he is a multi-talented student. Uh, so he is actually founder and uh, student head of uh, Circuit Quantum Research, uh, which is there in RVC right now. Uh, so and also like uh, it's also part of. Uh, sorry about that, which is an organization uh, dedicated to spreading awareness and knowledge about uh, quantum computing and related fields in 